All right, welcome to the KCP community meeting. Um, it's almost, August is almost over. Uh, winter is coming soon, I guess. Um, this meeting is as always uh, guarded, or not guarded, but it's, it's conducted under the CNCF Code of Conduct. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, that means basically it boils down to let's be excellent to each other. And yes, MJ, I need to make winter jokes uh, because it's too hot. So I just hope that the temperature goes down in my mind. It does. But anyway, um, we don't have anyone uh, new. So I don't think anyone would like to introduce themselves. Um, so why don't we jump right into the topics? And the first topic on the agenda is the cluster where rest mapper, Stefan. Yes, this is just a, a, a link. Ask Prorepius, please take a look. The problem this solves is basically to make the controller runtime client, which is cluster aware, so you can pass a cluster in the context to make it work against um, arbitrary workspaces. At the moment, it, it kind of just works for virtual workspace, uh, virtual workspaces where their uniform kinds and resources. So the client currently goes to the root, which on, only exists, of course, in the virtual workspace and gets uh, the discovery information from there and never goes into a workspace or logical cluster and gets them from there. So this PR changes that. And it's tricky because um, you need a REST mapper. A REST mapper is um, stateful, so it needs um, the state of the discovery API, basically. So what I did here, I, I added an LIU cache, which um, keeps a number of REST mappers in place, and also clients, if I remember right, so clients with REST mappers. And um, when you access logical cluster directly, it will go to that logical cluster, get discovery, or get the REST mapper from the, from the cache, if there is one, if there is one, it creates one. And so this makes a, controller runtime client usable in general contexts. Of course, LIU cache, yeah. Um, it's a LIU cache which uh, has a, um, uh, a timeout for objects, so they go away after, I know, 30 seconds or so 30 minutes. I'm not sure what I said there. You can configure that, so um, the estate, there's overhead, obviously, but this kind of information is not so huge. If we don't have a million logical clusters, it should be fine, I think. Yeah, please take a look on the approach. If you have better ideas, please speak up. All right, that, that sounds pretty good. Um, let's take a look. Um, one question I had from this, and I'm like, I didn't look at the codes. So I'm not sure if it's a it's if it's a valid question or not. But I know that we're also doing this kind of like clustered rest mapper in a couple of places in the Kubernetes fork. Um, is this something that would be usable there? Because I, I know there's like some comments in the code, yeah, we're instantiating one REST mapper per thing, and that's expensive. And Stefan, you're on mute. It's critical here in the controller runtime client because it does a REST mapping every single time for every request. So it's a bit different, I think, so there's more value to keep them in memory. I'm not exactly sure where we use them in Cube, but maybe for similar reasons, if you do REST mapping in garbage collection, for example, probably something like that. I, I think at least the admission plugins uh, use this kind of per thing REST mapper, um, per okay. cluster REST mapper. Yeah, so it's, uh, since the answer is it's worth to look in Cube what we do there, and if there is value in caching, sure, we can use the same approach. All right, or we can, if we find <laughs> usage just there, we can move it over or something. Also, that is an idea of us. So just to refresh my own head, like controller runtime does that because we use dynamic client all around the place. No, it's not. It's not dynamic client. I, I think. But it's, why is that? 
because it gets an object and doesn't know the resource. So you, you pass like a, a workspace object and it has to map that to the resource and then map it to the right client, either dynamic or not dynamic. Mm. I'm not even sure, is this dynamic in the type case? I'm not sure, but it's okay. unrelated. So it's before that, before it even uh, calls a client, it has to know the resource and for that purpose, it maps. Right, interesting stuff. I can I can take a quick look at it if I can find the places where we do it in Cube. Yeah. And, and okay, let me quickly add this. Uh, okay. In the meantime, uh, if there are no more comments on this, uh, Stefan, the next topic is also yours. Yeah. So I have some slides. Let me try to share. Uh, you should see my browser now. It's something about variance. No, we can see it. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I need this reminder here what which uh, workspaces are. I mean, they are proxies, proxying requests from a controller usually through KCP, but it's it's doing magic in between, like filtering projection change of identity, all those crazy things we know about. And um, there's one case, and maybe this is a deja vu for some people, when you write a controller, so on the left side, maybe I switch to Excalibur, it's bigger, one second, this one, so you can see it. Okay, so I assume you can see it. Um, so if a controller, this one here, creates a workspace directly against KCP. Of course, this works, right? You can have a controller which uh, has permissions, for example, it's a KCP admin. So it can, can go into every control, uh, every workspace, every logical cluster and creates another workspace. This is obvious. Um, but there's one detail already. We have an owner annotation on workspaces because uh, on workspace type initialization, uh, that user is used. So this is an identity. So um, yeah, this yellow uh, user here um, is recorded in the workspace and that controllers, KCP controllers do their work, but it works. So that's uncontroversial, it's unproblematic. But uh, if you try the same thing and you use a controller which speaks to a virtual workspace. So imagine you claim workspace access. So you claim, the power to create workspaces in your, I mean, in your customer uh, luxury clusters, basically. And you do that, um, yeah, it works. I mean, you can create this full project here. So project is my, um, it's a it's a resource which uh, abstracts workspaces in this use case. So, but this is not really important. You can create that and um, where well, you see it actually, so uh, once they're back, you, you see a project, this is initiating basically or telling the controller to create a workspace. So this is this is all this. So the controller goes, and this is now the important bit here, it goes and creates a workspace. So it goes through its virtual workspace uh, for the API export, and it will see workspaces as a kind, as a resource. So it's all fine. And uh, the create request then is mapped onto some fake service account in the virtual workspace implementation. And the reason is that we want to give the user of the API export, like this green user, the permission to create that works, um, this workspace object. So it could well be that the yellow user cannot access the parent logical cluster here, this logical cl cluster called parent, because it's, it's, for example, just the service account itself. So the yellow user is not an admin. And to give permissions, we do this trick. So we impersonate a fake service account of that logical cluster. That's all nice. Um, we create our workspace and again, the owner is reflected here as an annotation. So this time it's this fake service account. And now the workspace mechanic starts. So there's a workspace controller in KCP. So it sees the workspace. 
it schedules and creates a logical cluster for it. It makes the user here, the green user admin via a cluster role binding and cluster role. Up to here, everything is fine. And then we have a workspace um, initializer controller. So there is one in KCP which creates API bindings. And this will impersonate as this green user, this fake user. But the, the green fake user is a service account belonging to the parent. So this request will fail. And I mean, there are more cases like it um, doesn't have to be this initializer controller. Um, you can write your own workspace type initializer, the same thing will happen. So basically, um, we have a number of problems. Service accounts, they are local. So they only belong to one workspace and you cannot expose them anywhere else. They can never access uh, another logical cluster. And of course, we have this um, impersonation here, which is questionable because we lose identity. So um, the yellow user is not, yeah, in the whole flow, it's just forgotten. Basically, there's nothing yellow anymore. So yeah, this is a problem. And I'm just double checking. Everybody is happy. And I didn't talk for myself for the last 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, still, still following. OK, so um, this is one idea to solve the problem. So a variant, if you look it up in a dictionary, is a legal document that allows someone to do something. And if you look here, this which workspace wants to give the yellow user the permission to do something, right? This sounds a whole lot like a variant. And uh, just as a reminder, what we have already in Cube and in KCP, we have impersonation. Impersonation, and uh, yeah, MJ gave you this example in the Slack, so um, you know it already. Impersonation means you go to a local authority and claim to be your wife. Basically, you, you change your identity for everything which happens afterwards. You are your wife because you have this document. Or you have impersonated, let's say. You don't have the document yet. A variant, this document, this legal document, means you go to local authorities, you, you keep your identity, so you are you, but you have this paper, this document, which um, tells uh, the people working there that you can act as your wife. So whenever your wife would have to sign something, you can do it on her behalf. That's about it. And again, looking back here, impersonation. So this user, what does it want to, 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 to do? Basically, it wants to give the export identity, the yellow user here, it wants to give it a variant to do stuff in this logical cluster. So maybe we have to attach a variant to the impersonated uh, user here. Um, actually, if you if you try to do that, um, it's not completely yet what you want. We need both. Like in this case, we just talked about and you see in a second. So what we need is the virtual workspace has to change the identity. So it has to use impersonation. So in this example here, you go to local authorities, you claim to be your wife. So you impersonate your wife. But this new identity gets a variant from yourself. Like you, you give it an identity which keeps the power of the virtual workspace user. So you look your, like your wife, but you have a variant of yourself. And if you look back here, so this request, we want that this becomes yellow. So this should, the owner should be the controller, which means you have to change identity, which means you have to use impersonation. But you need the power, like the yellow user needs the power to do anything here, so it also needs a variant. And this is basically, um, yeah, it's written down here, same scenario. But now the virtual workspace impersonates as a yellow one at the variant, and then it goes forward. So the owner is yellow. The owner is made, like the yellow, the controller user is made the owner, the admin of the workspace. The workspace type initializer controller will take the yellow identity to bind uh, APIs. And here is how I implemented that. So it's user information, you know, from Cube. So it's a user controller user, the yellow one. It has groups, but basically just authenticated. It could have other groups. 
And then there is um, an extra field and there can be multiple. So the extra fields, there are slices. So you can have multiple variants and it gets, um, yeah, the, the power from this fake user account to uh, service account to access the, the this parent of JE cluster because this is a service account for that logic cluster. And we, I mean, the, this is a special case for the API export virtual workspace. It attaches a group to make the service account admin in that uh, logic cluster. So this works, it's implemented. And yeah, if you, if you look here, um, so the, the, the topic I talked about here, let's let's take a look. So it's about variance. It's about service accounts, and I didn't talk about that yet. So this service account here, the question is, is this is this valid? I mean, what does it mean if if this is an identity? So the, the two identities here, so the yellow one plus the variant. If this happens to be used here, what does it mean for the service account? So if you have a system of a variance, so the variance system, there's one extension which is um, interesting, namely to make our service accounts finally a global thing. So service accounts, they look like that, right? They look like user system service account and their namespace name. And we don't make them global because, of course, this name is not unique across logic clusters. But with this variant system, we can make them unique. So we can give them another identity. Basically, we, we change this name here to something else. But we also give them the old service account identity. So we can basically rewrite service accounts. And I do that in the PR if you want to see details there. I do that there. So the result is service accounts in the PR can be used elsewhere. And you can even bind them, like you can bind to the yeah, to this um, unique name, like the rewritten name is unique across uh, logic clusters because logic cluster um, ID, like the hash is part of the name. So this is connected service accounts can become global using variants. And last but not least, if you, um, if you, do something like like that here. So imagine we don't want to use a service account. We want to um, we want to to attach a real identity as a variant. I mean, a service account is bound by our our custom KCP annotation. So this is authentication to IO cluster name. So we we restrict service accounts today in KCP. So we we scope them. But if you take the scoping uh, concept, um, uh, yeah, you, you lift it up one level and make it official um, for every kind of identity. You can imagine you attach something and you scope it. So you attach a real user and scope it down. And if you look into the PR, um, this is highly related because it's basically the same area of code which you have to touch. So where, I mean, the code which evaluates variants is also a perfect place to evaluate scopes because it can skip variants, it can skip identities. All right, so th those are the topics, all highly related because the uh, implementation just um, suggests that, basically. That's all I wanted to show. Um, the implementation is complete. I, I put some other stuff into the implementation, so don't be surprised it's not green. Uh, it used to be green. So uh, with some more work, if I remove the stuff which doesn't belong there, I think we, we could get it green. But of course, it needs a deep review. So yeah, again, take a look, please. And the authentication, I imagine, will be like if if there is a where weren't attached to the user, you basically chain them. Try one, try second. Yeah. On basically what I do. Um, if you remember, yeah, if you remember the, the authorization chain. So of course we have the the Airbag. Um, we have a couple, I think three Airbag uh, um, authorizers at the end. I basically call them 
with all variants as well. Like I go through the variants in addition, I check the scope. If the scope is not the luxury cluster, I skip that. And um, this way, basically the policy applies and you can bind, you can bind against the service account, for example, because if, you, if the variant um, has this unique name, it's not a service account anymore, we skip, so you can bind to it. Um, one more thing I do in front of the, those three normal airbag authorizers, we have a couple of specialized KCP authorizers. So we have one which is called workspace content, I think, mm -hmm. which basically checks that you can enter the workspace and even do something. Uh, I mean, even the, the most basic things. We have required groups, so we can restrict which ORDC user can actually go into a hierarchy. And I know three other things I forgot. And every of those steps basically evaluates um, the variance. So I, I've wrapped those steps in the chain uh, and call them as a primary identity. And if this doesn't allow it, I call it with the variance recursively on every step. And this, this looks pretty great. Um, one thing that came to my mind is it feels a little bit that we are basically working around the fact that we don't have object to object relationship in assigning permissions, right? So like the API binding thing there fundamentally, if you could like tell or express via RBAC or similar system that this workspace is supposed to allow, is allowed to be a binding an API export, then we wouldn't have this like specific problem yeah, that you I mean, mentioned, right? There's a general problem and we see that in the workspace types um, what you describe is, um, I mean, everything, every authorization is done via users in yeah. Cube, right? It's not from a workspace. Yeah. And what we did there, we, we added the, the owner as an annotation, which is also kind of dirty, but it allows us to still have a user and, um, yeah. Yeah, all good. I know that we, you know, can can fix this or anything because it's something that is like missing in Cube. I was just curious um, because it came to my mind because I don't know. This kind of stuff is basically okay. We are like putting everything on the owner, but that's like fundamentally not what we want to do, right? So yeah, as a as the owner topic, I think it's kind of orthogonal to this. Um, okay. it, yeah, it, it motivates part of what we're doing here, right? But making service accounts global is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, because it's it, when writing controllers for a real system, I felt like in a straitjacket. Um, I cannot use service accounts because they break so easily. In the moment you go across workspace and this just happens, right? If you automate something across a logic cluster, you need an identity which works everywhere. Otherwise, it's just hard. Or impossible. And the result is basically people have worked around that right in the past, but what they did, they just used the system master user, which or KCP admin at least, and skipped the virtual workspace, which we all don't want. All right. Lucas, you're on mute. Lucas, you muted. Double muted. Or wrong sound device. It's always pulse audio. Yeah, maybe. Uh, so Lucas mentioned something about what you see in service accounts and identity. Um, the scopes actually are something like an audience, I think. And I wonder. That's another question whether maybe we can use some audience mechanism which exists somewhere already and use that instead. Just a, a thought. But you had this conversation before. It's not a lip reading. Say again. No, uh, we, we chatted and Lucas mentioned something about 
OIDC and service accounts. And I, I, I'm not deep enough yeah. into in this topic, so I cannot comment whether it makes sense. Just repeating. And I guess if Lucas managed to enable the mic. Did you turn it in it off and on again? It, it's always Google Meet or Teams or Zoom. One of them is going wrong. OK, uh, Lucas, if you have, I mean, you can also add a comment maybe on the chat if there's something that you want to bring up. Um, I think I'm in the same bucket. I don't know enough about authorization authentication stack to give a meaningful comments. It looks usable. I can see where it could be useful, but uh, consequences of that, like I, but we yeah, can one, always change after that or migrate. It's, it's cool. Yeah, one big question is, and same for me, I don't have this background. Is there something similar maybe in a standard format like in the ODC world? I have no idea. Claims like a normal one, but uh, but it has a use case when you run this without OEDC, like when you use uh, auth tokens, files, and like a no OEDC provider, and you have local users which you want to mix and match. I think this solves nicely that case too. But claims are audiences, basically, right? Right. Like you, it's people overload those sometimes. And they are not exposed in user info today, right? In, in so user basically, input? No, in user info. So you need basically a certain claim in your in your token to get access to cube, right? But then it's just forgotten. It's not used anymore. I think I changed to the, the groups. Like I said, I don't know enough. It might, at some point, we will need to look into supporting like uh, multiple identity providers and identity providers. Like I think we talked at some point structured the uh, OEDC config, because there will be a case when you need to have multiple something, and this might change. But at this point, I think it should be good enough. Yeah, and we can also mark that as experimental maybe because it's it's basically not used by i mean it's used by virtual workspaces like the ones we we offer maybe if you have your own you might also want it but this is like very deep i mean you're a deep um, developer already in this topic so you can also switch to something else if we change it all right the service account be writing this is yeah, this is kind of visible because you bind to the new name, right? Yeah, that's the one. But the service account stuff, like we can, if there is a better way to do, like where, where and plus impersonation, service account still stays. Like we still need that way to bound it across logical clusters. Yeah. So there is, I think, smaller risk. Yeah, and some words about the PR. So I added quite a number of uh, tests, especially end-to-end -end tests. Also about yeah, things we haven't tested before. So subject access review, subject, self-subject review, is this a thing? All the combinations of subject and self and rules and whatever exists. Impersonation. Okay. More coffee and I will review it again. Maybe when it's not 33 or 34 outside. Yes. Pretty good point, yeah. Uh, OK, it doesn't look like Lucas is coming back. Do we have more on this topic? Ah. Yes. I Beetlejuiced him. Plan B, mobile. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. <laughs> now you can hear me. Um, yep, yep. Yeah, I'm trying to, to now think what I was going to say. <laughs> 
uh, lost the thread. But um, I think some of the interesting things uh, here is like who if if we had, for example, list filtering. Uh, so like the workspace is being this kind of um, problematic when they have to be both in, all, uh, in different places. If we had list filtering and, and stuff like that in Cube, like Marvin was kind of saying that it's not in Cube, would that help in any way here? Like theoretically? No, I'm not sure. I think it's, Marvin, correct me, but what you guys uh, were saying, you cannot, so you cannot reference uh, things cross workspaces, right? You cannot say, I allow every workspace of a certain type or something like that to do something. Yeah, that, that was more my idea, like basically extending, I mean, I guess it's not Airbag exactly, but extending the like way that authorization works, that you know something can be authorized yeah. by the object that it's related to instead of the user, right? What I, yeah, what, I mean, forget about this owner for a moment. I, I think if you if you think about this request to, um, done by the by the yellow controller, forgetting its identity when it does something is wrong. I think, like impersonating as something else doesn't feel right. So I want the the yellow user to to yeah, basically do its thing under its own identity. And at the same time, I, I, I have to, I mean, virtual workspaces are made to give additional permissions, right? That's their purpose. So we need something which brings those two things together. So it's it's not about inner workspace or something like that. It's about, yeah, we, it's a special kind of impersonation, if you want, which is different than impersonation. Yeah, so for kind of the, the the specific case of giving using going through the virtual workspace and giving more permissions, I think the warrant makes sense. Um, and Lucas, we I mean we have some some proxies internally, right? Uh, where we basically use an admin user at the end to do the the right thing, right? But in a in a general system like like KCP, this is I think bad practice. We use the service account already. To restrict yeah. it, to make it a bit constrained, but there, this is the problem go, doesn't go away because we want to preserve identity. Yeah, I think it's kind of the same. Like you, you give essentially like the work, yeah, the proxy, like the virtual workspace proxy. Yeah, you give that using say normal RBAC the the stuff that you want any like. The all users in aggregates to be able to to do, and then you have to check before letting a user do that thing. You have to check that should they. I have the I might no no, no, no it's, myself. It's, the it's, controller will do it, can do it, but like should the no, user it's, it's, it? and then add. usually usually uh, you can't do it if you're the yellow controller. You cannot do this action. That's the point. Normally, if you go directly to to KCP. You cannot yeah. access this workspace, not at all. It's just invisible for you. Because you are a service account somewhere else. So we are okay. adding permissions. So we are kind of escalating what you can do. So, so now we basically generate system master certificate distributed like to these controllers, which do everything, not via workspace staff, but a global API directly. And that's like a to elevate the permissions to what it needs to be doing. But we constrain them again to not expose everything. Yeah, but basically that. Yes. Yeah, this is so how. Go ahead. No, you can go ahead. No, so I think this is how I implemented on our end. Like it's just, uh, to work around this ability, like kind of have some controllers are super powerful. And you explicitly give them that power via certificate-based uh, identity. And some of them are not. I think this kind of solves the least privileged controller challenge, especially when you deal with these uh, 
in OpenShift, there was a project. So when you create a project, it provisions a namespace, how to decouple this thing permission-wise that don't give permission to create a namespace, but still allow self-service. So this is like, I think, same, where you don't give access to create workspaces enough, but you give access to self-service. I mean, an additional uh, factor is that the airbug for this is being given um, on the like API export side, right? And not in the workspaces where the objects are being created. And that was also, I think, part of the idea because otherwise, if you like needed to have airbug within the like target workspace, then the workspace owners could like, well, lock you out by not giving that permission. And then you end up with this weird thing where, I don't know, like 50% of my resources for my API export, I can actually process, and the other 50% are missing airbag. I think that is also part of the problem, right? Right. You can Thank always you. start a global controller which reconciles airbag with each and every workspace. But again, we end up with a global controller. <laughs> So would would there be a possibility? So like, I see the use case for this kind of uh, say the virtual workspace service being kind of like R back in code or like enforce per specific permissions like in a special way using code instead of actually writing the the some R back probably R back wouldn't be or our back isn't expressive enough to well, it, it is said, basically, do that. It is said in code. We just use Airbag to configure this access. Yeah, exactly. But but basically it's done in code. I mean the virtual workspaces they're not dumb. They know exactly what to allow and what not to allow. Yeah, yeah. No, so that, that's what I mean, that it's done in code, uh, but just flipping on its head like could it be done not in code could could the virtual workspace and these other similar things could not be yeah, done in code if there was some kind of cross r back cross workspace r back capability but that's that's the thing like the the virtual workspace i mean it does some checks in the beginning and at the end of the day it makes a request to kcp and this request shouldn't be anything special so it shouldn't be in code. Like, so it's a normal request. And this should be secure. And that's why we, we need real users. We, we cannot just leave it as admin because then it's a privileged access. We don't want that. We want that the yellow user really does its request with a bit of more permissions. So like it's a variant on the side. But this is not like this, the mechanism, the, the actual request is done at the end to the workspace. This is no code. This is standard, standard request. You know, that's, that's definitely nicer. So one of the questions I had initially when, when you um, proposed this was that like, so the normal request, so, okay, this normal request with the warrant hits KCP proper. And now KCP needs to first authenticate the request. So it authenticates the request somehow. I don't know what the virtual workspace uses as authentication mechanism, but um, using a cert certificate, for example. And then it rewrites the user info through impersonation because now mm -hmm. uh, that's what virtual workspace use. Um, and now, like when it sees the KCP, um, user info extra warrant thing is there something like i mean in our case yeah it's we know we can trust the work, uh, virtual workspace uh service right to to set these warrants but on a more general level um you could give our back access to essentially virtually anyone to impersonate also user info extras. And if we start building a system on of like that, yeah. I, could, I mean, I could just add that's to my a, user impersonate. That's uh, the right intuition. Um, yeah. I didn't talk about that. 
but to in general to impersonate you can, with variance you can get more power of course and you can impersonate into identities which you shouldn't impersonate to but you are admin in your workspace so there's one principle we want to allow everybody being admin in the workspace without risking the ability of the system so you are admin you can give your self permissions in other words, we have to restrict what you can actually impersonate with. And again, yes. there are scopes. Scopes can do that. So everything you impersonate into can be scoped. And so you can impersonate in your workspace. That's fine. You can basically claim to be any identity. But it's just in your workspace where you're admin already. So it doesn't matter. So we need scopes for that. So, so any any no, so service accounts are easy to scope, right? Because they always exist in a logical cluster. But like, how about generic OIDC, like any other type of mechanism? Like Same thing. Uh, uh, if you if you impersonate as a OIDC user, so I impersonate as Lucas, like you are OIDC credentials. In the moment I do that. I would get a scope for my impersonated identity. So my Lucas identity has automatically the scope. The system adds that. So I can be Lucas in my workspace. But in the moment I use that outside, it's just not valid. So just to replay this back. So if we start adding third party virtual workspace uh, operators into the system, this is where these kind of risks appears. When somebody has malicious virtual workspace in a system which can do funky things. So we don't want that component because this, this, what we're talking is internal traffic to the KCP. Like impersonation doesn't happen from outside. It's basically traffic generated within inside only. Like well, can't, can't impersonation happen anytime. Like you just set the yeah. header. Any user can, with enough RBAC access, uh, it's a, it's essentially a uh, impersonate verb on. Well, it's a little bit funky. Like some has the the authentication group and some do not. But right. uh, <laughs> there's some authorization happening. Yeah. But if you like, if you send it from outside, I think we clean those. We don't allow them. Or no, we allow them. That's a different topic uh, we have to talk about. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, it's uh, impersonation is something which can be done by an admin, but it's essentially if we are not careful in a, a privileged operation which goes beyond admin. Right, I don't have enough hours in a day to read up all about these things. I'm, I'm very new so, to KCP's special authorization as well. <laughs> so to, to, to summarize what I think what this is starting, we kind of localize identities, right? So we make identities potentially locally valid only. Like they are public ones, but those you have to get from outside of KCP. But in the moment you do something internally, they are localized. Like they are only valid in a scope. So, so that that's what I'm trying to understand. Like, um, it, for example, OIDC authentication. Like uh, last time, which is probably a year or two ago, when I looked at uh, KCP's OIDC mechanism, uh, then that was configured for the whole binary. Is that still the case? So like there's flags that's essentially a, because it's yeah. a cube or you see uh, yeah. yeah exactly so uh because those are global right um if we add the scopes uh the work logical cluster scopes to these identities then does it mean that like when i make a i as with a lucas token make a request against logical cluster one i will be scoped to logical cluster one, but then 
when I make a request to logical cluster two, I will also be Lucas, but scope to logical cluster two. Is that essentially what they're saying? Even though I, 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 I have a global, like I'm, I'm valid in any workspace I could go, I'm that the same user and valid everywhere. Not necessarily, I think, for the normal request. But in the moment we we use an identity, store it or pass it elsewhere, and we know what it should be used for, then we scope. And of course, this is not really a formal definition, but uh, imp fair. impersonation is such a thing, right? Um, and uh, so imagine um, coming back to the to the wife example. So you get a variant from your wife, and the variant will likely be scoped, right? It will say something like you can, I don't know, uh, register for, for the driving license for your wife. It will not say you can do whatever outside of the um, local authority, you can do whatever. Vote, for example. It will be scoped. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this clears it up a little bit, but I, when 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 impersonation comes into the picture, it's not only authentication, right? It's also authorization for being allowed to impersonate. So that that's the the yeah. link that you well, the like, the next step that you need to also like pass through. And well, that means that you need to be authorized in the workspace to be allowed to impersonate. And like you're not getting like a like an impersonation token bag or something. So your your request needs to pass the authorization check for impersonation at that moment. So yeah, the, the funny thing is that the I mean it's logical, but the impersonation authorization is done in the authentication phase. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> those those three words. <laughs> so yeah, but the the kind of the 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 check of like, are you able to switch identities is done before you get your new identity. And so kind of you authenticate in Cube APIs or this filter of authentication, that's your original one. Then the filter of impersonation, which checks that can, okay, you are this original user, but can you change? And only then you rewrite and then you go to the real authorization after that. So yeah, like that, and that is uh, trying to figure out how that maps into KCP will, yeah, well, need some more time to think about it. But again, like all of the uh, kind of all of what Stefan, uh, you know, proposes makes sense. It's just trying to figure out if there's holes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's good to have, to have a complete model, right? Uh, we don't yeah. have a formal model of authentication authorization. Yeah. Makes it hard. And, and Lucas, you mentioned one thing which was on my head quite a, read, a lot. It's like the that we have single identity provider currently for a binary, and we were structured the authentication config. There might be place to like dynamically load them, but again, how you how you say which one applies to which potential workspaces or logical clusters and inheritance and all that stuff it's a, it's like yeah. as soon as you want to build a SaaS on top of this it's like first enterprise feature you need to kind of deliver is bring your own SSO bring yeah, your yeah. own identity provider into the like to have multiple providers in the single binary yep yeah, actually so why why I said um I was doing some 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 work like not for upbound where I'm now, but like way, way before. And um, for someone that wanted to to build this kind of type of thing. And we and, and that, that's why I looked at it. And then it was like, yeah, no, it's it's per binary. Uh, but yeah, definitely you want to have that. At least if not for the issuer, then at least for the audience, right? So that like you 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 don't by even mistake get some uh, 
people with some or wrong audiences to the wrong workspace. Like you want to fail. Like or say it like that. If if you would set it up not using KCP, using you know a hundred API servers, then you would set those API servers to validate only certain credentials. So like a certain issuer plus audience combination. Um, but now that it's all in the same binary, you still don't want to like you still want to logically have that same thing of like these only these specific combinations of tokens or trust domains, which it essentially is, is valid in these these types of places. So we yeah, have... that, but that's another scope. That's a completely other topic. But <laughs> but yeah, no, it's, a... it's, 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 yeah, we have the required groups, which. If I remember right, they they walk up the hierarchy or so logically. So it basically uh, there's a the root, but can we deep in the hierarchy? And everything below then requires certain groups. And what you are talking about is basically audiences, right? You would require something if you want to if you want to enter this tree, you have to um, have this audience. Yeah. Just right. one interesting bit: if we have this multi workspace or DC. What is also biting us here is a system master is um, that's a special group in cube. For example, it skips authorization and maybe other things. So one critical or dangerous thing is that we, we want to allow to be cluster admin, but never system master to normal right. users. That's that, that authentication layer basically would need to filter aggressively on the groups, right? Yeah, and especially when ODC is configured by a user, then it's even more yeah. important, right? No. Yeah, I, I have some some decent um, experience now with the structured auth, auth config and some some stuff to uh, probably to upstream to make it like similar to what Stefan did for the generic control planes, I think. Some of the code there in in the API server now taking care of the structural config might be, or for KCP it would be useful if that was a library more than built into the and now it's built into the options uh, config kind of struct and start running Go routines inside of the the thing. So so I have some some thing there. If it helps, we could maybe look at that, but. Um, yeah, again, it's a little bit orthogonal, but but kind of feels similar of like what users are even valid at what places, and and then uh, at the same time we yeah we want to get rid of those kind of maybe hopefully we could make it so that system masters is not a thing like i mean we kcp doesn't have to follow the kind of completely unbounded thing like i mean is there something that system master shouldn't be able to do then it would make sense to kind of have a yeah an allow list for it of course but maybe a deny list as well instead of skipping both the skipping all authorization phases essentially which it does now don't we, we need, need users which, which, which are system master? And we could, could, of course, be named system master, which is something else. Doesn't help. You can still give the group, right? So, um, some property of a user we need to identify those really privileged users. Actually, in, in uh, New Cube, uh, there is also audience. So, like uh, the we can probably use that. Um, so like, not only do you get user info back, you also get, and this was made for workload identity, uh, not at all for this type of use case, but but so audience in cube is returned as an in the authenticator response. Uh, and but from there not, you can- It's not passed on, is it? Yeah, like it in, is. In the chain, how? In the chain, yes, uh, in the context. Ah, okay, I see. So, so that there you could have one thing where, which is like, well, this is system ma uh, user is system masters, but it comes from OIDC, and then you would reject it. Uh, versus it's come system masters, but it's a client cert. I trust the client cert more, so that you can do.
That was a Lots fun cracker conversation. What can I say? <laughs> Lots of thinking going on there. Um, yeah, I think this is, you know, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll you know, do a review of, of the variant feature and see where we go from there, I guess. Um, I just want to, because we only have four minutes left, MJ, you wanted to give an update on the code generators refactoring. It's just, uh, I can do a quick, quick elevator pitch. It's basically more for the people to know where I'm spending a bit of time. So a uh, bit of history and in digging into the cube layer. So I basically started refactoring Kubernetes 31. And I ran into issue with our code generator, which was produced two years ago, stopped working because of uh, Stefan's removal of core group in some of the APIs. But so this is how our current basically code generator looks like. We have very much uh, big chunks of uh, temp Go templates, which uh, are rendered into the files. And what caught my eye is that I looked to the upstream code generator repo from six years ago. It's basically nothing like that. So I think two years ago, at some point, we basically pivoted and did our own thing. And this got me where it said, OK, we kind of not aligned to upstream. And maybe because we started rebase early, let's bite the bullet and try to redo that. So yep. and so basically, I'm, I, not sure, I'm not sure if you remember, but I think I opened a thread during the 1.30 rebase asking mm -hmm. about, the, about basically the same thing. Right. And then we said, you know, well, the, the upstream stuff is kind of complicated. Ours is working fine, but <laughs> if, it, if, it, it's, if uh, it's broken now, then uh, it's worse until it doesn't. That's the point. And it stopped working. So, like, all this stuff is new to me and I didn't like touch before, but basically, we're based on that. So, I started refactoring our code generators. I wouldn't say refactoring, but basically, it's a, a reworking from scratch because there is not much to refactor to a nature of our uh, codes itself. Meaning we use this, uh, like when we example, generate a clients for uh, objects, we have this behavior where for certain clients, example, cluster, we have this uh, cluster over method which returns upstream interface implementation and some of them like return substream clients, some of them returns locally generated one. So basically, this is what I've been doing. I've been spinning around and uh, refactoring our SDK to be same style as upstream, but I don't think we will be able to maintain a fork of upstream because of how far apart we are. But it will be same methodologies used. And I'm not sure what people think about that. It's like I'm, I think I'm halfway there, but it's a, it's a monster of the change. To be honest, a lot of boilerplate. Yeah, it's a complete rewrite. From looking at like when I did the comparison, I was slowly backing out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> so is what what are these informers and clients used for these days is it for it's not for controllers right this is used internally we have two use cases one is basically hey i'm uh, i want to talk to virtual workspace in a not using controller runtime but using a pure typed client so hence if you try to generate these things now with upstream code generator, it will not work because upstream code generation is the case spits out not cluster aware clients. So one use case is where I'm hardcore not using runtime. I'm basically writing my own stuff. And I think we use internally the two. But the problem is that uh, I said it's a this is our SDK is kind of layered on top of upstream SDK. Because some methods return upstream implementation, some of them our things. So it's a bit of layer on top. So that's basically like, and I'm, and I'm taking lazy fast forward. Like I, I can see that upstream did this uh, 
I think it evolved during those like multiple years that they had the single template and bunch of FLs inside of it to cover like three use cases. And I think I just better have three templates clearly readable and we can optimize later on else it will take a few more months. Yeah, no, I, I was thinking, I was thinking as uh, there's so much controller runtime usage these days that what is uh, like, what is uh, the, the consumer type that uses uh, the type to inform us these days? I mean, maybe it, it well, it's it saves on the cover, but it's used by our uh, KCP is built on them. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We need them too. Maybe we don't like this is a, this is a good, good topic. And I know we are running over on over time the complexity explodes very much if we want to support a custom crds generation like custom clients stuff if we want to just do our own internal types no sorry it's, we, we need that for the workspaces our own logical clusters so scratch that we still need that yeah, so we, we also use that for so if we pass an informer or a client to cube, right? We 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 have those informers which are cluster aware, and we pass them somewhere yeah. else. We need scoping, like you can basically project, um, like hide everything which is not in the uh, given cluster, and you still have the same interfaces which are cube compatible, and you can use cube code. That's and, I think the main reason. Uh, and one more thing which I'm descoping basically in my head is that upstream now uses generics to generate a client. And I'm not yet in the position where I can mentally map template, uh, overlay client on top of client, uh, template and generics in my head. So basically I'm skipping that, but I think we will need to come back to that. I think the like generation framework is based on generics these days, no? I can even do it without. No, you can't. That's the point. It's just, ah. it, 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 the reality is the generation framework itself is a, just a type walker and template renderer based on files and types. Okay. I, I, I thought the generics were deeper embedded, but okay. All right. In the spirit of being over time already for five minutes, which hasn't happened in a while, um, I think we wrap it up. If you have some follow-ups, I would suggest to maybe add them to the agenda like right now so we don't forget about them and we can pick up where we left pick up where we left off uh, in two weeks. And I would say Yeah, you can you can you can blame it on me <laughs> being over time. <laughs> no, 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 there, there's no blame here. This uh, these are great technical discussions that we need to have. So it's great that we're having them. Um <laughs> Nothing beats our discussion about airbag on Thursday evening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think that was MJ's way of saying I would like this meeting to end. Um, that means have a great afternoon, evening, morning, wherever you are, and uh, talk to you soon. Bye bye. See you. See you.